This is a story of exploration and revelation. The English physician William Harvey lived in the 17th century and was perplexed by his observations of the heart and the movements of the blood around the body. What he saw didn't tally with what he'd always been taught. So he decided to investigate what was really going on. Harvey asked some fundamental questions about the workings of the human body. The answers he found transformed our understanding of medical science and are remarkable because they still hold true today. William Harvey was a scientific rebel. While his fellow scientists clung to the teachings of the ancient Greeks, ideas that had gone unchallenged for 1400 years, Harvey used observation and careful reasoning to discover the truth about how the human body worked. He began by asking a few simple questions. What really happens when a heart beats? How does blood travel round our bodies? How does blood nourish our body? Although these questions may seem simple now, they had baffled the greatest thinkers since the ancient Greeks. One of the greatest of the Greek philosophers was a man called Galen. He imagined the heart as a kind of furnace, a place where air and blood were mixed to create a life-giving warmth that nourished the body. Galen thought the vigorous beating heart actually sucked in life-giving air and expelled vile, sooty vapours. Galen didn't fully understand the human body. He believed that blood flowed in the body like the tides of the seas. He believed that when blood reached the parts furthest away from the heart, it became flesh. Although he was wrong on many points, Galen had grasped a crucial idea that the combination of air and blood and the action of the beating heart were essential to life. Remarkably, the world accepted Galen's ideas for the next 1400 years until Harvey came along. The animal's heart is the basis of its life, its chief member, the sum of its microcosm. On the heart all its activity depends. From the heart all its liveliness and strength arise. Harvey just couldn't accept the magical ideas of furnaces and sooty vapours. Instead, he turned to what he could actually see in the bodies of living animals. I have demonstrated the first beginning of the chick in the form of a little cloud, after removing the eggshell and putting the rest into clear warm water. In the middle of the small cloud, the throbbing point of blood is so tiny that it disappeared from view on its contraction to reappear as a red point during its relaxation. And thus, between being visible and invisible, or so to speak, between existing and not existing, it gave a representation of the heartbeat and the beginning of life. By the observation of chick embryos and their gradual development into chicks, Harvey realized the heart was not the magical furnace that Galen believed, but simply a pump. He was hypnotized by the regular and endless beats. Where was the blood coming from? And where was it going to? I then began to wonder if blood moved, as it were, in a circle. Harvey realized the heart squeezed tightly, propelling blood into the arteries, eventually returning back to the heart through the veins.
Harvey saw that as the heart contracts, blood begins the first part of its journey around the body. The heart gives a characteristic thump-thump as its valves close. Travelling in a double loop, blood is first forced to the lungs. Here, each red blood cell soaks up a precious cargo of oxygen and then returns to the heart. Next, the heart pumps blood on a longer journey into the rest of the body. Having returned to the heart through a vein called the vena cava, blood is drawn into the atria, the upper chambers of the heart. As pressure builds, the atria contract, forcing blood into the lower chambers, the ventricles. Next, the muscular walls on the right and left ventricles contract. Here we can see the left ventricle forcing blood out of the heart into the body's main artery called the aorta. Blood travels twice through the heart for each circulation it makes through the body. The heart is actually a double pump, simultaneously pumping blood from the right side of the heart to the lungs and from the left side to the rest of the body. It's the pressure of the blood itself that causes the opening and closing of these valves. Their colour tells us they're not richly supplied with blood. They have no muscles of their own. Although Harvey observed the double beat of the heart and the action of the valves, he could only speculate about what caused the heart to beat. He knew that physical exertion caused the heart to beat faster, but he couldn't possibly know how. The answer lies in the pacemaker cells. The rhythm of the heart is orchestrated by two clusters of cells in the heart called pacemaker cells. An individual pacemaker cell beats to its own rhythm. Combine two cells and they start to beat together. It's these cell bundles that stimulate the cells of the heart muscle to contract. As the body increases its demands for oxygen, the pacemaker cells become more active. The heart beats faster. Despite the clarity of Harvey's ideas, he had many critics who still clung to the old beliefs. Since that birthday of the circuit of the blood, there has of a truth been scarce a day in which I have not heard both good and ill reports of the circulation I discovered. Some think that by my experiments, my observations, my own uh, visual experience, that I've established the circuit of the blood against the whole force and strength of argument. The others, that it is scarcely as yet sufficiently elucidated. Harvey's problem was that he couldn't complete the circle. He couldn't see how blood passed from arteries to veins. He only knew that it did. Today, we know these vessels exist. They're called capillaries. Capillaries are the almost invisible hair-like threads that transport blood to reach every cell in the body. Only one cell thick, they form an impressive network of tubes. In coming so close to the truth, both Galen and Harvey had wondered what life-giving force blood actually carried. The answer we know today is oxygen. Here, individual blood cells squeeze through Harvey's elusive capillaries, slowing down just enough to release oxygen into the surrounding tissues, nourishing the body.
William Harvey really laid the foundation by sol uh, discovering the uh, circulation of the blood. They, but of course, when William Harvey made his discovery, oxygen hadn't been discovered yet. That, uh, I think, took another something like 130 years before oxygen was discovered. In 1962, Dr. Max Perutz was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on discovering the structure of a protein called hemoglobin. This was the answer to Galen and Harvey's question. Hemoglobin was the elusive oxygen carrier found in the blood. Hemoglobin is the red stuff of our blood. Without that, we couldn't live because without that we couldn't get the oxygen. So you want to find out how does, how does it transport oxygen? What does it look like? Donut shaped, these red blood cells possess enough hemoglobin to carry millions of oxygen molecules. If you prick your finger and draw a drop of blood, that contains about 3,000 million red blood cells, which you can see under a microscope. Each of those red blood cells contains 250 million molecules of hemoglobin. It's within this protein, made up of 10,000 atoms, that oxygen is trapped while it's transported around the body. Today, our knowledge is more complete. Using modern technology, we can separate blood into its many components. We find that blood is actually a mixture of many parts, including agents that prevent infection and others that aid clotting. Digested foods and wastes are also transported in the blood, together with the oxygen-carrying red blood cells that are suspended in a liquid called plasma. sister arranges the instruments and checks the swabs. The porter and the anaesthetist bring in Bobby and lay him on the operating table. The saline drip has been changed for blood and the transfusion is kept going throughout the operation. Because red blood cells carry life-giving oxygen bound to haemoglobin, doctors are able to transfer blood from one person to another. In emergencies, blood transfusions save lives but there are problems with this. Today, there is a very real shortage of blood, a shortage made worse by risk of donor infection with HIV and hepatitis. Calls for clean and uncontaminated forms of blood have never been greater. The real prize for scientists who followed in the footsteps of William Harvey is the creation of an artificial oxygen carrier, a replacement for natural haemoglobin. So this is a computer graphic of uh, haemoglobin molecule. So we can now produce haemoglobin outside our, our body uh, by simple fermentation. Dr. Kiyoshi Nagai leads a research group at the Cambridge Laboratory of Molecular Biology. And, but by gluing genes um, together, we can actually produce molecule which doesn't fall apart in our body. Dr. Nagai has picked up where William Harvey and Max Perutz left off. And his main interest is in making artificial haemoglobin using modern genetic engineering. Uh, Hemoglobin is the actual component which carries oxygen around our body. So we, we wanted to make human hemoglobin uh, using bacteria. And if this uh, becomes possible, then we can make unlimited amount of human hemoglobin uh, by simple fermentation, just like uh, brewing beer.
Here in America, Dr. Nagai's vision is being realized. Vats of artificial blood are being made. The process is simple. Dr. Nagai was able to isolate the recipe for human hemoglobin and give it to small bacteria called E. coli. By growing large amounts of E. coli, Dr. Nagai had made an infection-free supply of artificial blood. Clinical trials is now being carried out in the States uh, to show that uh, this artificial uh, oxygen carrier uh, is not toxic in our body and also uh, to show that uh, it actually works in our body. Uh, and probably in the few years' time, uh, it may be possible to uh, use, use uh, this artificial oxygen carrier in, in patients. The discovery of the function of the heart and blood came about by people asking simple questions. I then began to wonder if blood moved, as it were, in a circle. We are passionately interested in what nature is made of and what we are made of. My motives are the same as Harvey's, to, to, to find out what's going on, how nature works.